Hi, Jeff. Welcome to, uh, I don't know, this conversation. Uh, I'm Ruben Peralta. I have a website and I write for many, many, many outlets. My website, cocalecas.net, I post my reviews and everything. And uh, Jeff is the director of the famous now uh, documentary, The Social Dilemma, who talks about the, you know, the privacy or the breach of yeah. privacy that we have in our social accounts social media accounts. And uh, I don't know if you want to say something before we start with- uh, Just thank you so much for having me, Ruben. It's great to meet you. And, and thanks for having me on your, on your interview. Something that I, that, that I wanted to create with you, and I, I know that I have uh, 15 to 20 minutes. It's like I post questions in my Facebook uh, timeline. I know it's ironic. And, uh, and people, I ask people, like regular people like from my timeline, my friends, what, what, what would they ask if they have you in front of like, yeah. right in front of you? And I have a couple of questions. Like, I like these questions. Like, the first one is come from Ramon Grullon. He's a very really good friend. He, he wanted mm. to ask you, what do you think that the world we would like right now without social media? Just imagine what would it be no like? social media. How it would, would it like, like right now? Like, like we all I think we would be, America. I think we would be less polarized. I think we would be less distracted. I think we would, um, we probably would have a different president in the United States and, and probably in a couple of other countries as well. Um, and that's just a reflection of the fact that we know that, that these platforms have manipulated past elections. Um, I think our teens and their mental health would be better, would be stronger. Um, you know, we're old enough to remember a time before social media, but our youth are growing up where this like mass hypnosis has been in society for their entire lives and they don't know anything different. Um, and the social comparison and the, the real harm that it has on, on youth is really startling and really scary. Um, there are other things, you know, a lot of people talk about how these platforms are used to mobilize and to bring people together and organize and rallies and all of that. And, and I agree with that, but people have been protesting and demonstrating for generations, for thousands of years, right? I, I don't think those things wouldn't be happening, right? The, um, we see footage of police brutality in the United States because we have cameras now everywhere it's the camera on the phone that's giving us access. I don't actually think it's the social media that it's just the social media is a place where those conversations are growing quickly right now. But if that footage existed, it would still in an older time, yeah. it would still get out through news outlets and the conversation would be elevated and, and people would, would react and respond. So I, I completely 100% acknowledge there are really good movements that can happen through these platforms and great energy and great activism. Um, but I think we also just need to recognize what some of those costs are now and the consequences that it's having, having on our society. So you, the, your friend posed a really great question. I haven't really thought about that. I'm, I'm trying to think through right now, what would the world look like if we could sort of rewrite the last 10 years or so? Um, it's a great ex thought exercise. In, in your movie, it's something that happened they, that actually broke my heart when I saw it. It's the irony that the guy who created the like button, yeah, his idea to do this it was to create something for good, right? But now it's like affecting uh, the social, like the, the mental health of many right. many people who actually right. don't have enough likes when they post right. something, right? And uh, like it really struck me, like it's true. Yeah. Like sometimes you even feel bad with some when someone block you or unfriend yeah. you. Like, oh my goodness. Why? <laughs> it, it's a huge, right? You take it very, very personally. These are, these tools were not designed by psychologists, right? By child psychologists. Uh, Justin, as you said, he had this innocent positive attempt for intent for what the like button was hoping to bring just like mm -hmm. some positivity, but now it's grown to a scale. I think this is part of it. These platforms have just gotten so much bigger than anybody expected, right? Twitter was designed as an art project. Yeah. They wanted it to be this like small thing. Like, and, and it morphed. These business models grew so big. They designed 
growth algorithms into it. They designed it to grow as big and as fast as possible. You know, Facebook's motto used to be move fast and break things. They did move fast and they did break things. Like, I feel like the motto needs to be move slowly and fix things. That's what we need to shift to. We need to think back about like, what is constructive, useful technology in our lives? How does it help improve humanity, improve society, improve civil discourse, improve conversations, improve relationships with my friends and family and not be structured around a business model that is extractive? My friend Richard Alvarado, he works in, in, in security, online security, and he's, he, like, he went too technical. He went like, those, oh. you see current privacy legislation like CCPA or GDPR having any impact in making social media companies accountable for data reach, breaches in a social media user can specify proof of how this has been run by the breach. Like if yeah. I have been it's affected a, by it. Like Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that those, um, the, those pieces of legislation that have come in have been helpful from the perspective of reminding the companies that they can be regulated, right? And hey, there are some limits. And if you say you can't do it, we're gonna put these laws in place and watch, you can do it, right? And I think that's a good reminder for the public and for the companies, because if more meaningful and more important legislation comes in, hey, companies are gonna to have to comply to these regulations too. And we know that you're gonna be able to do that. Like you have the resources to do it. So I, I think those particular things, like no, nobody has put on the table like a real, this solves the problem piece of legislation. People are talking about antitrust. That sort of misses the point. Yes, they're yeah. big companies and they're too big, but it's like you've got Exxon Mobil and if you just break them up and now you have Exxon and you have Mobil, you still have climate change, right? The problem doesn't go away by breaking them up. We have this business model with these companies where the business model is inherently the problem the business model is at odds with society, just like the business model of the fossil fuel industry is at odds with society. If we yeah. keep extracting from the ground and you know, emitting and polluting, like we're, we're gonna continue to see the consequences of climate change. That's what we're seeing with these tech companies. We need to change the business model. And I think that's the big question moving forward. How do we come up with meaningful legislation that addresses the, the real inherent problems in the business model? Giselle Spinal asks, like, how we can minimize with our kids? I have a, I have a two years old daughter, almost two years old, mm -hmm. and I'm really concerned about what will be happening in ten years. Like, yeah, like Facebook it was born in 2009, and look yeah. at what will happen in eleven years. Like, even elections yeah. has been reached yeah. by by Facebook. What will be happen when my daughter turns 15 and she have a mobile phone? Yeah. Or like how, right. how me as a parent can minimize the effect of my kids with all right. the social media. They, every two right. years, we have a new social media. Right, TikTok right. It was nothing two years ago. Exactly, exactly. Uh, I'm trying to look in my drawers here because there's this, there's this thing that I got. Um, I can't find it. Well, it's like, it's, I thought it was right here. There's a thing called the light phone, L-I-G-H-T. And this is going to drive me insane because literally it's one of, <laughs> in one of these drawers right next to me and I just can't find it. Um, there are companies that are trying to rebuild phones that aren't connected to the internet all the time, that aren't going to notify you, that don't have news applications or allow other apps. Um, I want Apple to make a really, really good phone like that where I can make good phone calls and I can send text messages and I have my calendar and I have an alarm and that's all I that's want. <laughs> Maybe music, I want my music, right? Yeah. Um, basically go back to the iPod. Give me an iPod with the phone, but get the rest of the internet off of it. And something like that. I mean, we're seeing companies start to rebuild social media as well. There are new social media companies that are being born right now where technologists are trying to reinvent social media. Like what? And like, can you mention one? There's one called Clubhouse. I know one called Clubhouse and it's, it's in an early stage right now. And I don't know what their business, they, like, they don't have a business model right now, it seems. Like, but they are interesting because it's not designed around likes and blah, blah, blah. It's really designed around intimate conversations with people. So it's just audio only and people get together and hey, we're gonna talk about this issue today. 
and people are ha people are having conversations about the social dilemma apparently very regularly and so i'm i'm eager i want kind of want to hear what they're saying but um i'm optimistic that the technology could be very different but for you in your example like i would you know, as your daughter grows up and as she starts to have friend circles, talk to their families, make sure that you agree together, no phones until this age. Like, I think high school. Like, I, I don't think they should that. have a smartphone. No I... smartphones until high school. Get the whole school to agree. Get the, right, not just your friend circle, but get your junior high school, your elementary school, middle school to agree. Okay. We don't want social media here. We're going to protect our children. We're going to give them ways to engage with each other, but we don't want homework assignments through Facebook or through whatever, right? And so that's stuff that families can do and can work on um, to protect the kids. You say something really, really, really special and about like, like waiting for, a, for like, like 12 to, I don't know, 14 years old. And I remember that I had a conversation with a coworker and she had this app that she can see at all moments what the kids are doing like she can see oh, who, interesting. Can, who can like everything that, that's and, interesting. Uh, and uh, even she can block their cell phones and it's funny wow. because she told me she told me like hey uh do you want to see how they call me now in two seconds and she blocked their cell phone and then like 30 seconds after she's like she's having a phone call from from one of her kids saying like hey what do you block my phone I said no that's I, so sorry, funny what's my accident and uh, oh my goodness that's funny so my last question is like, you think that we need to have these extreme measures for these extreme things? Because, well, I'm a physician. I work in a hospital, actually, besides all this. And uh, I have seen patients that they feel depressed because their friend don't give them likes or because I have patients that they were dating online and something happened. Yeah. Like now, Simon Sinek say, say, say it very clearly, like now we live in a generation who want instant gratification. Yeah. Like everything is fast. You want something from Amazon, right. boom, you can have it in two days. You right. want a date, swipe, and you're dating. Right, right. Like you think that we're already there at that point that we are not turning back or we have to find a new way to... to no, this. I, okay, that's a really great question. And I... I am optimistic about that, and I don't think um, uh, I think we can resolve these and we can fix them because the brain is really malleable. Like our brain can adjust and it can readjust. Yeah. So the addictive feeling that we have from these technologies, oftentimes it's um, it's considered uh, a dopamine deficit state. So if you get a lot more dopamine, if you're using these devices, you get overloaded with dopamine. When you don't have them, you feel withdrawal. You feel like you're missing, like life isn't as good as it otherwise was, right? And so we're seeing that trend and it takes a while for it to calibrate back. Um, personally, uh, because in large part because of my past films too, Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral, I've spent a lot of time in nature. I love nature. And I think nature is a really amazing place where you can be reminded, first of all, of how big the world and the universe is and how small we as humans are in it. And it reminds you when you're out in nature that, wait a second, all, everything that I thought was a big deal happening on you know, Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok, it's not really a big deal. If you don't have cell phone reception, you can't connect to it. So one of the best things, there are places that do like a digital detox or a wilderness retreat. And if you spend a week in nature and get away from your phone, you're reminded of, this is what life is. Like, oh, these feelings oh, that I life. have. Oh, right. This is actual <laughs> life. This is real life that's going on. Oh, yeah. And and I think the brain can be recalibrated to that. So for me, I was a very, very heavy user of social media. I was really addicted to it. I started to take myself off of it. I felt the social media apps trying to get me back, like actively fishing to get me back. And I had to fight through that. I mean, literally, there's a whole month or two where I have emails and text messages coming in where the, the algorithms were throwing everything at me. Come on, oh, here's a person who you know, here's a friend, here's a, a professional relationship. Oh, they posted this thing. Oh, this person posted that. 3,000 people commented. Why do you wanna come back and see? I could feel how manipulative it was and I needed to like wean myself off of it. But once I got myself off of it, I've had no desire to go back. Like I've had no desire. I realize now in the process of making the film, I have a very different perspective of what these technology platforms really are. 
what they're really doing to us and if they're giving us the public the benefits that we think we're getting from them. And so it's changed my relationship and I feel better. I feel healthier. I feel like my mind is clearer. I have my own time in concentration. I'm not being distracted by social media trying to like pull me back into it just to watch another thing that somebody else said that I really didn't need to see. And for me, it's been a huge shift. And, and I hope that for other people that that can be an inspiration as well. And we can question, are these devices, not the device, are these platforms, are these uh, social media apps really benefiting us or are they distracting us? Are they giving you something that you really want in life or are they just occupying your time? You know, you get a ping, you get a notification, you open an app and two hours go by. Yeah. Is that what you really <laughs> yes. wanted to do with your time? Right. And so I, those are the questions that I'd, I'd like people to be asking themselves after they see the film. And I, I hope the film can help people go down that path. At the same time, just one, one last note, um, on our website, thesocialdilemma.com, we have a lot of resources and discussion guides and trying to help people have conversations with their families, have conversations with their friends, um, and to think about the tech in a different way that hopefully can help them improve their lives. Do you think, this is just uh, to close, do you think, do you actually think that social media or like all these platforms, they are the bad guy in the movie, like the oh. evil out there? Or like I, I don't think that the people are bad. I think the people in, meant well and intended well. And I know a bunch of them who still work there. They're good-hearted people. But they started designing something around an inherent vice. They knew something was wrong at the beginning. And they still decided to go through with it. They knew that there were problems with the business model. And they still decided to go along with it. As an example, Larry and Sergey, the founders of Google, in their PhD thesis, they wrote that if a search engine was funded by advertising, that over time it would corrupt the incentives of the company. They didn't want to use advertising at the beginning. And yet when they were facing financial crisis, they said, hey, we got to make some money and maybe, okay, the advertising is not that bad and we can use advertising and, and they seemed to change their stance. But they knew from the beginning that it was going to be problematic. And they, they went down that path anyway. And because they were so successful, Facebook copied it, Twitter copied it, a bunch of other companies copied that model. And now they are worth more. That's the richest industry in the history of money. Yeah. Yet it's based on this problem. The people are good, but the business model is bad. And the financial forces around them are bad that make it hard for them to change. And even if they want to change, they're having a hard time doing it. That's my biggest hope is that people at these companies say, you know what, we need to do the right thing. We need to make the difficult decisions and we're going to make these changes. And we're going to, you know, we're going to step out on a limb and we want the public to go with us and to support us as we change a business model. And that's my hope. I, I, I believe we can get there. It's just code. You know, it's just code that people wrote and we can change the code. Jeff, thank you so much for your time. I really thank you, Ruben. enjoyed the documentary. I think it's the missing part of the Saigas uh, yes. documentaries. Yeah. And uh, we never expect to be so hard in, in, in this uh, internet thing, like my grandma right. said. And, uh, <laughs> I, I really appreciate your time. And uh, thank you. Beautiful. Man. Thank you so much, Ruben. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Adios. Bye-bye.